Uh, we're here with uh, legendary film director Mike Hodges. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for coming to Falmouth and, and talking to us. We really My appreciate pleasure. it. Um, I think I want to start by perhaps talking a little bit about your first film, or perhaps your, your most well-known film still, Get, Get yeah. Carter. Um, with it being your, your first feature, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you um, managed to get that role as, as director and, and maybe your sort of transition from your earlier TV work. Well, I, uh, I started working on 16mm on, on programs like World in Action, which was a current affairs program in the 60s. And I then uh, took over an arts program called Tempo, which I converted to si using 16mm film totally. And then I convinced Thames Television or ABC in transition to put their drama on to film because it's much more saleable. In other words, in those days, because you used video, which was complicated to edit, and because there were all sorts of different, uh, uh, what you, how would you call it, uh, different... What kinds of formats. Formats, that's right, the right word, formats. Uh, that if it was on film, that was a, it was a, an international format. Sure. So I then wrote, directed, and produced one film, which was called Suspect, which was very successful. And then I did another one straight after, it's called Rumour, uh, which was very different. The first one was a very Chabrolish film. The right. second one was much more new wave. It was much more Jean-Luc Godin, and sort of a very bit flashing forwards and flashbacks, right. and just that's what's going on. And that was seen by a lot of people including the producer of, uh, who had the rights to Jack's Return Home, which is the right. novel on which Get Carter was based. So uh, he approached me, the book, oh, and the book just dropped to the letterbox. It was a slim oh, wow. book, and uh, with a letter saying that I want to write and direct the film. I wrote it and said yes. And uh, Kane wasn't attached to it at that point in time. Right. I think he may have been, I've never quite got to the bottom of whether he was involved, but was waiting to see what the script was like. Sure before committing totally. Right. So anyway, I read the script and I got it in January and I finished shooting in, in August. Right. And d did you have um, um, a specific concept for what the film would look like, what its tone would be? So obviously there's quite a lot of violence and there's the, the, the sort of um, look of gritty realism I think that you perhaps you were going for. Was, was that in mind? before the film started? Well, it, it, it was, and if you'd seen my television work, you'd know that yeah, it was yeah. a sort of a kind of extension of that. It was a lot of using a lot of long lenses. Sure. And also the choice of cameraman, who was really quite an old man at that point, Wolfgang Schlesitzky, who had done a lot of documentary work. And uh, whilst the technique that I used was very different to anything he'd used before, um, that I, that's what happened. I mean, I was very lucky in so far as that Kane was incredibly collaborative, right. and it meant that I didn't have to do the normal process of, of putting scenes together. In other words, I didn't have to give him a close-up, so right. I could do sh the whole sequences in one shot once I choreographed it. Mm. Um, and I didn't have to go through the normal process because he trusted me, right. so I could shoot a whole scene on the back of his head if I wanted to. I could do anything. He was just incredibly generous in that sure. sense. And I was also, he was surrounded by actors who'd never really done any work on film before, apart from Britt Ackman. So um, that, co that collaborative relationship with Michael Caine, then, would you say that that's something that um, a director kind of looks for or looks for that kind of support where the, the, act, the, the lead actor, the protagonist, um, knows what you want, but also it means that, you, that they trust you to, dire to direct them? Well, obviously, there's always an element of, uh, there has to be an element of trust, whoever you work with. It's nice if you work with an actor at least twice, as I did with Kane, because I then went on to make a film called Pulp. Sure. And in, when I discovered in Get Carter, for example, that Michael Kane couldn't drive, he physically couldn't oh, drive. Right. So when I came to do a scene with him, and I said, OK, Mark, would you want to get in the car? And his minder took me aside and said, Michael can't drive. <laughs> I said, what do you mean he can't drive? I said, he played a chauffeur in Alfie. So he said, no, no, he was towed around all the way through. So, I said, so he, was, he was a good actor at driving exactly. as well. Yeah. So, so I had to. So in the next film, I put a scene in where it was painfully obvious he couldn't drive. And the guy says to him, can you drive? And he said, no. Sure. So, uh, so I could build in certain things. And wow. I also got to know him. So I, it, was a, it was a comedy pulp, you know. So right. I was able to build in Michael's sort of character, really. And then years later, it was with Clive Owen when I did Creepier and then I did I'll Sleep and I'm Dead. 
and that was another very happy relationship. Sure. So, so you, you've done quite a few films that do have that sort of um, thriller element, but they're also, you know, there's a, a sort of realist element to the um, to the way that they might pr um, portray British life. Maybe did did you did you sort of have a conscious sense of the kind of filmmaker you wanted to be? Yeah, I mean, I was when I did, you know, going way back into the fifties when I was like twenty two. I had to do my national service in the Navy, and I chose, I didn't have to do it in the Navy, I ended up in the Navy, you didn't, you didn't choose the Navy, to have some freaky accident, I was offered the Navy, which I was incredibly grateful for, and I could have got a commission, but it meant that I had, to, I was already a chartered accountant, so sure. I could have got a commission, as I said, but I didn't want to be on large ships, and I didn't want to be in a base as an accountant, I wanted to go to sea, so I went on the lower deck. Now, the lower deck for me was my education. I mean, I saw poverty the likes of which I'd never dreamt of. Right. And I came from a lower middle class family. My dad was a commercial traveler for Wills. I wasn't, it wasn't a rich family, but I had no concept of what the, the, the horrors that I witnessed. Sure. They were all fishing ports. We were a fishing protection squadron, so it was lower stuff, Grimsby, Hull, right. North Shields, and so on. So I was pretty angry by this time. So when I came to do Carter and I read the novel, I remembered all these locations that I'd seen when I was doing my national service. Now, for example, in Hull, there was an amazing pub called the Albert Hall, which was about as big as the Albert Hall. It was covered in sawdust, and, sure. you know, there were punch-ups every night, and so on and so on. So, and of course, I was dressed as a macro, so I was, a, you know, my bell bottoms and things. So I could go into places quite happily without sure. anyone. So I was a kind of spy, really, in okay. many ways, and I was watching this Hogarthian world in there. So I was, you know, I went from being a young conservative to being a socialist right. overnight, virtually, and yeah. a pretty rabid one. I was quite angry. Yeah. So I, I, the film, the portrait of Britain that I've always portrayed is totally different to the one that that is portrayed in quite a lot of British films. Sure. Um, and I, 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 then after that, of course, I'd done World in Action, where I'd seen the the corruption. Uh, the British had a very curious view of themselves. They thought they were above corruption. They thought the police were wonderful. They thought, right. you know, and I knew that this was total, a total fantasy. You know, sure. they were seeing the whole country through rose-tinted glasses. So I was interested in puncturing that vision, sure. and I've done it ever since. Yeah, actually. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So if we talk a little bit about Flash Gordon then, yeah. that seems completely atypical yes. to that, that kind of social conscious filmmaking. So sure. why did you take that project on? Uh, I needed the money, right. and two, I needed, I, I just had a disaster, well I've had, Pulp was very well critically received, yeah. and then I made, went to Hollywood and I made a film called The Terminal Man, which was, I think, it, obviously I think it's a terrific film, but it was sure. terrible, uh, it had no box office appeal whatsoever, right. it was a very tough film mm. to watch, um, so I, my career was looking very shaky, and then I took on Omen 2. Um, right. And I had a, it was a nightmare, so I, I left. I mm. decided I didn't want to do go. Do you have on. a screenplay credit for that? For I do, yes. Yeah. Um, and it was all, uh, the producer was mad. He, but you know, he sort of he would sort of take out a handgun and put it on the table. Wow. So you want to shoot me and things like that. And I said, yes, I'd love to shoot you, but I don't. <laughs> I won't end. I don't want to end up in jail. Thank you very much. Right. So I was. I got out of that one. Yeah. This is Dino so, Dillon. Dillon. No, 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 sorry, no, no, no. This is the <laughs> producer of Omen. Oh, right. Big so time. now Nick Rogue was going to do. Uh, Flash Gordon initially, and he'd introduced me to Dino because Dino wanted to make me to make the sequel. Then he and Nick fell out, and they, he came back to me and asked me to do it. And I said, "Look, I'm totally an appropriate director for this film." You know. Anyway, he convinced me, and my two sons convinced me too. So I took it on, and I'm glad I took it on. Yeah. I had a wonderful time two years doing sure. it, and I have given a lot of enjoyment to people. Like yeah, you know. well, I mean, it's, uh, that's the, my next question. I mean, what, what do you think about the sort of cult love that the film seems to have developed over the years? Well, it was a big success here. You know, it was yeah. about one, I think it's one of the ten top grossing films in the 80s sure. in this country. Absolutely. America, they screwed up the distribution because right. Sam J. Jones had left the film, so they didn't have the star of the film to use for publicity, to mm. do all the talk shows and the rest of it. So, and then it was very big in South America and in Italy, all the primary colour, so it was always a big-ish hit. Sure. Um, but the critics, of course, being the usual snobs that they are, right. with the exception of Pauline Kell in the New Yorker, who gave it a four-page rave, okay. she was the only person who seemed to get it. But everyone sort of bitched <laughs> at, the only people, they all bitched about how much they 
thought it had cost and it was a trivial and all right. sorts of stuff. Of course. That's the end story. So um, between um, Black Rainbow in 89 and yeah. then Croupier in 98, obviously there's a 10 year gap there. Sure. Was that kind of a frustrating time for you? I mean, did it say something to you about the way the film industry was going and the potential for funding and that kind of thing? I don't think I've ever, I've never really fitted into the British British scene generally, I sure. think, actually. I, you know, I just don't fit here. If I'd lived in France I'd have, after Carter, I'd have made a film every year. Right. Uh, but in this country, one Carter was always regarded as slightly off, you know. Yeah, like yeah. Right, sort of right. Like period film, it was a rather nasty little film. So I think there was that aspect of it that, uh, that, 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 that it was always slightly regarded as unsavory, but terrific, sure. but unsavory. Right. In America, of course, they thought it was just great. They didn't have the money to film was all that nonsense. Yeah. So I don't think I've ever really fitted in. So it's always been difficult for me to get money to, sure. make, to make films here. But then Croupier made that, and that got did very well and got very good reviews. So you, you but know. not here. Well, it, was, mm. it was America that say sure. Croupier. Here, the film channel for a uh, film for weren't even going to distribute it. Mm. So the BFI saved me on that one because they were re-released Keck Carter, and I said to them, "Well, that's my first film. Why don't you? Would you like to look at Croupier?" and see if you distribute that one as well. So they luckily said yes, otherwise it would have gone straight to VHS in those yeah. days. Uh, so I was saved by the BFI in that instance. Sure. Because not that they could, they, they've only had a few cinemas as you know, yeah. so they didn't get a proper distribution. But in America, a friend of mine uh, managed to finally get a distribution deal and it played, I don't know, for through, you know, like 20 months in America yeah. in about 170 screens, so it's very big and immensely successful critically. Fantastic. Um, just one final question then, are there any, who would, would you say would be your, your biggest inspirations or influences throughout your career and is there anyone at the moment that you particularly admire, the kind of films that you admire of today would you say? Contemporary filmmakers? Yeah, contemporary filmmakers or, or somebody you would think, ah oh, that, that, that person's got a sensibility that I, I kind of enjoy. Or, or you know, the real, I mean it's terribly sad, I live in the middle of a farm. Right. I hardly get to the cinema at all, sure. and because the f turnover in films is so fast these days, that when I see a film that I want to, I notice a film that I want to see, by the time I get to London it's usually moved on, especially sure. if it's a good film. Bad films tend to sit and they go around forever, but uh, the both good ones seem to disappear. So mm -hmm. I'm not really up, up to speed on contemporary film, I can sure. say. But you, you've got um, other ar artistic outputs as we were talking about yeah, before. Yeah, I paint yeah. and I draw and I write and I, you know, I have all sorts of and I garden, grow a lot of vegetables, aren't I boring old <laughs> So I have a life of my own, you know, apart from filmmaking. But the great filmmakers, like, I suppose the one I would most admire is Billy Wilder, probably. Right, okay. The range of work is just, sure. see, he would have done Flash Gordon, and he would have Absolutely. done a croupier, he would have done Get Carter probably. Mm. Yeah. You know, an amazing hit rate, you know, there's so, very, very few, he, what would you consider bad films? Really well, yeah, oh, oh yeah, unbelievable. He was an amazing director. Yeah, absolutely. When I went to Hollywood, I saw him in a supermarket by the, at the end of his, towards the end of his life. And he looked so miserable. He was terribly upset that his career ended. He, he just, right. he, like, he wanted to go on and on. Mm. So that was a bit sad. Yeah, maybe it's, you know, it tells us something about the contemporary film business, perhaps. Yes, although his late, later films were not all that, not mm. as good as his very early ones, I think. But he was an amazing director. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for joining us. My we pleasure. We really, really uh, appreciate it. Can I have Stalingrad as a payment? <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have to ask one of these boys, I think. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks.